begin, and um, good to see everyone here today, and Joe Choupé is not here, so we have our music box, so you have to forgive me, I have to futz around a little bit to make it work, but it's a, it's a lot of fun. So will the congregation please rise, turn to our first hymn of the day, there is a bomb in Gilead, and it's B-A-L-M, not B-O-M-B, -B, so it's not that kind of a bomb, right? It's for healing. What's the number? Uh, it's hymn number 5 to 63 in the blue hymn book, and there's three verses that are short. service. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we, hate, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may even delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for us. At first sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you, the entire forgiveness of all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Turn to your today's readings bulletin insert, and join with me in praying the prayer of the day. 
compassion in God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion. In all creation, we will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. The congregation, please be seated for the reading of today's lessons. As Bonnie comes forward to read, I want to do a little bit of an introduction here. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Okay? Now, what does Deuteronomy mean? Remember, there are five books in the Torah. The fifth, the fifth book is the book of Deuteronomy. This is Jesus' favorite book. He quotes Deuteronomy more than any other book. It's Moses, he's 120, he's about to die, and he gives three long speeches. Deutero means second, second. nomos means law, second giving of the law. If you won't, I want you to read Genesis 1 through 11, that's good, but you really should read Deuteronomy and have a working knowledge of it to understand what's going on. Now, Deuteronomy 18, this is a messianic prophecy. What does that mean? In your Bible, you make an M and you put a circle around it and highlight this in yellow. Moses is 120 and he says, God is going to send a prophet like me. And who's that? Jesus is our prophet, priest, and king. Jesus is the one. When they say the one, they mean the Deuteronomy 18 one. That's why this lesson's important today. So listen to Bonnie. She's going to do a great job reading this, I'm sure. <laughs> fourth Sunday after the Epiphany is from Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 20. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God anymore, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name, a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will the congregation please turn to our appointed psalm of the day, Psalm 111. We're going to be reading this responsibly by whole verses. All do the straight type. Congregation, you do the bold face. Psalm 111. Alleluia. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great, Great are your works, O Lord, Lord, pondered by all who delight in them. them. Majesty and splendor mark your deeds, and your righteousness endures forever. You cause your wonders to be remembered. You are gracious and full of compassion. You give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. You have shown your people the power of your works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of your hands are faithfulness and justice. All of your precepts are sure. They stand forever and ever because they are done in truth and You send redemption to your people and command your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice this have a good understanding. God's praise endures forever. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Psalm 111. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. Now concerning food sacrifices to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really 
exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though many be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will the congregation please rise for the reading they the gospel of sin. The appointed gospel lesson for today for the fourth Sunday after Epiphany is taken from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 1, beginning with verse 21. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath day came, Jesus entered the synagogue and he taught. They were astounded at his teaching. For Jesus taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes teach. Just then, there was in that synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him and said, Be silent, come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsed, ripped, and tore the man. And he cried out in a loud voice, and he came out of that man. They were all amazed. And they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. This Jesus commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the gospel of our Lord. Will the congregation please be seated? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, on the third Sunday after the Epiphany, we thank you for the opportunity to gather at St. Paul's Wurttemberg today. Open our hearts and minds as we prepare to wrestle with this great text in St. Mark chapter 1, beginning with verse 21. Help us to apply this to our life to have a deeper faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, stop. What are, we, what are we doing? We're reading the Gospel of Mark. Reading the Gospel of Mark. This is Mark chapter 1. What do you want to do? Go home. Don't believe me. Go home. Start at Mark chapter 1, verse 1, and make a list of all of the names that are applied to this person, Jesus. This is one of the ways of understanding who Jesus is. Make a list of all the names. If you do this for the whole New Testament, there's a couple of hundred names applied to who Jesus is. These are, again, like attributes. They try to describe one thing that Jesus did, another thing that Jesus did. Here we are. If you look in your bulletin insert, I put some notes in there because I know it's hard to follow. We have Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy One of God, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, the One, and this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. That's only in the first, like, 28 verses of the Gospel of Mark. So the idea is, you come to church because you want to know who Jesus is. 
You read the Bible because you want to know who is Jesus. Epiphany, remember? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. What would God look like if God was manifest or made known among us? That's what this is all about. So let's go to work here. Jesus and his disciples go to Capernaum. Stop. What's Capernaum? This is Galilee. Remember, it's the size of New Jersey. It's northern Jersey. They're going to get uh, 12 to 18 inches of snow today. <laughs> the middle part is Samaria. The lower part is Judea. That's where Jerusalem is. Okay? So the, he's in the northern part. He had just, just been to Nazareth, his hometown. What did he do in Nazareth? He went to the synagogue in Nazareth. What happened? His own people drove him out of the synagogue. They took him to an edge of a cliff. They were going to throw him off a cliff and then stone him to death. He came to his own people. His own people knew him not. It's common for Jesus to go to a synagogue. Now, I know this really disturbs people. It shakes them up. Ready? Is Jesus Roman Catholic? Because I saw a statue of him in front of the church. I'm sure he's Catholic. Is he Lutheran? No. Is he Methodist? No. He's not even a Baptist. Can you believe this? What is he? He's an observant Jew. What do observant Jews do? They go to the synagogue on a sun on a Sunday on the Sabbath day. Okay, so you count to you count to six, right? God created the heaven and the earth in six days. He rested on the seventh day. The Sabbath in the Old Testament is Saturday, the Saturday Sabbath. But wait, why do we go to church on Sunday? Half of us don't. They go to the Saturday night service, right? Now, why do we do this? Because each Sunday is a mini Easter. Remember that. There's 52 Easter Sundays where we proclaim to our neighbors when we walk out the door and go to church, we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Every Sunday is a mini Easter. So what's Jesus doing? He goes to the synagogue. What's a synagogue? Ten or more Jewish families are required to start a synagogue. What is it? It's a house of Torah study and prayer. It's like a community center, right? So it's like the, the town hall sort of in Capernaum. Now, Nancy Paul's not here today, but she's been to Israel. I've been to Israel. One of the stops you make on a Holy Land tour is Capernaum. It's this place. And they have a synagogue in Capernaum that's about the size of this building. It's destroyed, it's ruins, but there's some walls intact and so on. It's white marble, beautiful building. That's not the synagogue that Jesus was in. That synagogue is dated to about the third or fourth century AD. And what is it made out of? White marble. What's amazing about this, when you go to Israel and see white marble, there is no marble in Israel. They have black basalt. It's like volcanic, you know, like when you go on the train down to Peekskill, there's like rocks all over the mountain there. That's black basalt. So they use that to build the synagogue there. So that synagogue is below the one that's there right now, the white marble one, right? And you can actually see part of the foundation of it. So that would have been the, the synagogue that Jesus was in. So the white marble has to be brought in from Turkey and Greece. How much would that be? Extremely expensive. Right? So, so that's the synagogue. All right, so he goes to the synagogue, and he's there on what day? The Sabbath day. Stop. Time and space. What's the time? The Sabbath day. What's the space? The synagogue. Time and space. Jesus is an observant Jew. He's in the synagogue. Well, what is he doing teaching? It's a common, it's a habit in the synagogue, and I kind of like this idea, actually, that... If you're 13 years old, you're a Jewish boy, you get your bar mitzvah, right? That means you read the Torah scrolls. You have to be able to be literate. You read the Torah scroll and you are entitled as a man, a Jewish man, to comment on the Torah reading. See? So they, it was a very common thing. Someone would say, we have a special guest here today. We have Jesus the teacher from up in Nazareth, he'd like to read the Torah scroll and share a few words with us today. I mean, that would make, that, actually, that would make coming to church kind of interesting, wouldn't it? Right? So that's, so that's what he's doing up there. Now, he's teaching. Now, ready? How do you think about Jesus? Here's what you think. Words. Does he have good words? Mm -hmm. Read the Sermon on the Mount. Read his teaching. He has really good words. Do we know people that have a lot of good words? Yeah, I know a lot of people that have good words, right? Words, words, words. 
I'm a, I'm a teacher, I have a lot of good words. Do you want to model your life after me? No, you don't, right? Because I'm a human being. All have, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have a problem called hypocrisy, you know? Hypocrisy, what's that? It's when you wear a mask, you know, like a, not this kind of mask, like a face mask, right? And you're one thing in public, but you're something else in private. That's the human dilemma. Do we have a lot of hypocrisy? Yeah, sometimes we get politicians that tell us we have to wear a mask everywhere we go, but then you see them walking around without a mask, going out to some nice dinner, you know, having a dinner somewhere. Well, that's called hypocrisy, right? Jesus has good words, but he matches it with his deeds. You got this? Words and deeds in Jesus are perfectly balanced. You want to think of who Jesus is? He's one, it's like a scale. He balances words and deeds. He balances justice and mercy. Everything is in balance and in harmony. He's the absolute. He's God among us. What would God look like? Well, God would balance justice and mercy, right? He balances justice and compassion. He balances words and deeds at all times. Here we see an example of this in our text today. He does good words. And what, what is the reaction of the people? It says in the new, uh, new RSV, which is our translation, it says, they were astounded at his teaching. Oh, that sounds kind of boring, doesn't it? No, ready? The word. When Luther translates this into German, he didn't know what this Greek word was. So we went down to the butcher in town and he said, what word do you use when you slaughter a, like a, an ox? How do you slaughter an ox? You take the ox and you take something that looks like a chisel and you put it between their eyes and you pound it as hard as you can. And the ox falls down dead immediately, right? So that's the word that Luther uses. Hmm. It's not just amazed, no, it's dumbstruck. It's astounded. It's knocked dead by the teaching of Jesus. His teaching was so overwhelming that the people would have been like, what just hit us? It's like being slapped in the head or something. Like all of a sudden you're, you're like irrational and you, you know, slapped in the face and all of a sudden you come to your senses. That's the kind of astounded that they were at his teaching. What makes it so amazing? Because he taught as one having authority, exousia, that's the Greek word, authority. One of the micro themes of the whole book of Mark is exousia, authority. What gives this guy from Nazareth the right to go around saying things? Now, what kind of things does he say? He says things like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, if you analyze that, that's crazy stuff, right? But then what's epiphany? What does it look like if God became a human being and walked around? They would say things like that, right? Any person who would say something like that, if you're just making it up, or if it's your meds talking, that would be a violation of the first commandment. You see what I mean? So his authority, it's not, like, it's not like the scribes. Sometimes it's good. When I try to learn something, I like to read what the main argument is and then read what the critics of the main argument said and usually the truth is somewhere in the middle. This is a great way to learn. I like to read like, you know, if I'm teaching a, a class on the Civil War, let's say, okay? I just finished reading, this is like six months ago now, a biography of Jefferson Davis. Now, why would I want to read that? Because I believe in slavery or something? No, you want to read about Jefferson Davis if you want to get a deep understanding of the Civil War. They weren't like lunatics on the Confederate side. They had good reasons for doing what they did. And so you read about Jefferson Davis. How could this guy, who was a Secretary of War, he was a senator from Mississippi, how could he be so wrong, but yet being held in high regard and elected by the people in the Confederates? How is that possible? So again, you want to read both sides to get a balanced view of things. So it's like, okay, so they, they're astonished at Jesus. Well, what do the scribes say? What's their thing? So if you compare and contrast, we know what Jesus does. He speaks to authority. The scribes, here's what they do. When they teach, they would stand up and they would say, here's what the text says. 
Here's what the experts say. This is the consensus of human opinion of things. It's called argument from authority. They argue from the people that came before them. It's like case law or something. Okay? What does Jesus say? Jesus says something like this. You have heard it said from men of old, but I say unto you. Ah, that's why they're dumbstruck. They've never heard anything like this before. Because scribes always say, Rabbi so-and-so said this. Rabbi so-and-so said that. And you get bogged down in tedious minutia stuff. Things like, how do you wash your hands? Well, you take an eggshell, half of an eggshell, you put water in it, and you put it on this hand and this hand, the water has to run down. They have a ritual prescription for how to wash your hands. You want to come to the synagogue and hear that stuff? It's not really interesting to me. When Jesus stood up and said, look, you've heard what these, these experts have to say, the sages, but I say unto you, what would it look like if God became flesh and walked among us? He wouldn't go around quoting experts. Human beings are experts, okay? We know this now. You always watch TV, and some expert has an opinion on this, and, another one, and they're all wrong, and they contradict you. Who are you, who are you supposed to believe? Well, you don't believe this way, you believe this way, right? God is our source of the absolute. Jesus says, I say unto you. That's why they're astonished. Now, ready? Where does this take place? It's a Sabbath day, a holy day. Day of rest. You're supposed to go to, you're supposed to, go to the synagogue, you're supposed to study the Bible, and you're supposed to pray and be with your friends in the synagogue. Right? We hold each other up. That's why we gather for worship. It's a holy day, and it's a holy space. It's the synagogue. Who is talking? Jesus is talking. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God is talking in the holy space, in the holy time. What does Satan think about this? Satan hates God. Satan wants you to think he's equal or greater than God. Satan wants to rob the glory of God. So what does Satan do? He dispatches one of his minions. Remember, how many angels are there? There's millions and millions and millions of angels. The Bible says that one third of the angels rebelled against God and are cast out under Lucifer slash Satan, right? So there's millions and millions of demons around, okay? So the false gods that Paul was talking about in the first read or second reading today, they're demons, right? So if you're a polytheist person, you worship many gods. Those many gods you're worshiping are demons. Paul says it, St. Augustine says it, okay? So there's all kinds of demons running around. Do we think about this today? No, because we're atheists. Yeah, we're too sophisticated for this stuff, right? We don't believe this. However, the atheists who don't believe in God are the first ones to watch things like The Walking Dead or all the vampire movies. They're the first ones to believe in ghost stories. They're the first ones that'll say things like, Pastor Mark, I like Mrs. Isaacs and I like your dog and I like you personally, but I really can't come to your house because you live in the middle of three cemeteries. They're superstitious. They're atheists. They don't believe in God and they claim they don't believe in demons, but you know what? If you don't believe in God, if you don't believe anything, you believe anything. Some of the most superstitious, ridiculous people I've ever met are people that claim to be so much smarter than me. I'm just a stupid old Christian. Oh no, they're sophisticated. They believe in like crystals. And they believe that somehow the position of the stars has an impact over your miserable life. No, you have a control over your miserable life, not the stars, right? So God, you know, and why? Because Satan wants you to worship him, right? And who is he? He's a created being, a fallen angel over here. God is the only thing that's, that's absolute. The infinite God, the finite creation. Idol worship is worshiping the creator, uh, the creation, not the creator. So, what does Satan do? He can't stand the word of God. He can't stand the truth. He can't stand when God's people get together, when we lock arms, when we have Holy Communion, when we take word and sacrament, he can't stand it. So what does he do? In the middle of the synagogue, in the middle of the Holy Day, when the Messiah is teaching with authority, not like the scribes, 
He interrupts the service. A demon-possessed man comes in and starts ranting and raving and screaming and hollering. Why is that? Because they are not interested in debate. They want to be the teacher. They don't want to listen and be the student because you might actually learn something. They want to rob the glory of God. They want to break up the sweet, sweet moment. They want to smash the beautiful. They can't stand it. An analogy of this is when Jesus is washing the feet of the disciples and Judas, son of perdition, that's not a compliment, says, what a waste, what a waste. That's what Satan does. He can't stand the word of God being preached. So he interrupts, he starts screaming and yelling. He interrupts the service. Now, let me talk about demonic possession for a second here. Is this a real thing? Yeah, C.S. Lewis talks about this in the screw tape letters, right? And screw tape is giving advice to his young nephew, his disciple Wormwood, and he says, the first thing you have to do is to teach these stupid humans that there's no such thing as Satan and evil. <laughs> if you don't believe there's Satan or evil, you know, well then we've got it made because we can work like behind the scenes and act like anyone who believes in us is an irrational lunatic. Well, demonic possession is a very real thing. And so this man, he has an unclean spirit, holy, profane. What's holy? The synagogue is holy. Jesus is holy. He can't stand it. He breaks in. He's unclean. He's filthy. He's nasty. He's accusing. He's cursing. He's smashing things. That's him. He breaks up the service because he can't stand it when God's people get together. And he cries out. He shouts. Satan is a shouter. He wants to shout. Because when you're shouting, you can't hear. There's no input. Think about that for a minute. They want to drown out any opposition. And they say, and he, and he says, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Now, here's what's interesting about Satan. Satan mixes elements of truth in with his lies and slanders. Truth and lie are mixed together. They're mixed up. Like strychnine. What is strychnine? It's like 1% poison, the 99% inert elements. So that's what they do. They, they blend truth, they, they, they blend lies and slanders together. So, first of all, what have you to do with us? Ready? For God so loved the world, he sent his own son. God loves you. He loves the world, the broken and fallen world. He loves the world and wants to redeem the world. That's what, that's what he has to do with us. What, is, what do you have to do with us? I'm here to save you and save the world. And what does, what does this demon say? Jesus of Nazareth. And we call this doxing. What do they do? If they don't like you, they put your name and address on social media so that people can come and visit your home in the middle of the night. Yeah. So they, they name the name, the man, at his hometown. Think about that. Have you come to destroy us? Actually, yes. Jesus is here to do what? Destroy sin and death. That's what he's here to do. And if you read the book of Revelation like I do, what's the ultimate destination of Lucifer, Satan, and all the demons? They're going to be cast into the abyss, the bottomless pit. Do they like it? They're afraid of that. They scream and they yell, please don't put us into the abyss. Let us go into that herd of pigs. That's one of Jesus' miracles. They don't want to be sent to the abyss. It's sort of like some gangbanger, some tough dude, drug lord. He killed people and all this stuff. He's being sentenced to prison. They don't want to go to prison because they're going to be there for the rest of their life. 99 years plus one day. That's what these demons are. They don't want to go to prison. They don't want to be cast into the abyss. And they're shouting and screaming and yelling. And they're trying to divert. They're trying to divert. You got this? What's the purpose of the synagogue? To teach you the law. Because you need to know the 613 laws because the laws lead you to Christ. The more you know about the Old Testament, the more you believe in Jesus. The word of God is what we need to hear. They don't want you focusing on the real issue. They don't want you focusing on the word of God. 
Do we have a problem in our schools today? Yeah, we do. What is it? Um, basically, the schools haven't, the kids haven't been in school in about a year. So instead of talking about something like this, how can we make up for the lost year? Maybe the kids should go to school on June 1st and go to summer school. Instead of that, oh no, it's an attack on different personalities of people in the community. What is that? It's a diversion. Look at the shiny thing over here. Look at that other thing. No, the real issue is over here. Think about that. Satan is a diverter and a perverter. He wants you to do what? Attack each other, attack each other, attack each other. You know, in the Ch Chesapeake Bay in Maryland, when you catch crabs, what do you do? You throw them in the, in the bushel basket. You don't have to put a lid on the bushel basket because if one crab tries to escape, the other crabs will grab them and pull them back down again. Satan wants you fighting. He wants you to fight your family. He wants you to fight your boss. He wants you to fight the politicians. He wants you to fight your neighbors. He wants you to... Why? Because he's the author of chaos and confusion. Satan wants you dead. He wants you miserable. He wants you fighting. He wants you being upset all the time. That way you're not looking at the one true thing, which is what? Jesus. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what he wants. He wants... God wants you to believe in him. He wants you to look at the cross. Don't look at the current slaughter and mayhem that's going on right now. Think about that for a minute. It's amazing. And then he says, so he says, Jesus of Nazareth, he says, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Stop. <laughs> what is God's ineffable name? If you read the Old Testament, it's Yahweh. Right? Y-H-W-H, the ineffable name. We do not pronounce the name Yahweh. Okay? So God's name is Yahweh, and God's name for Christians is Jesus Christ. Satan can't bring himself to say the name Yahweh. So instead, he uses a substitute word, the Holy One of God. Is it true? Mm -hmm. Yeah. God is, Jesus is the Holy One of God. Now think about this for a minute. You're an atheist. You went to Bard College. You're so smart. You know stuff that most people have no idea. You're just a genius. You're so smart that you think that people that believe in God are stupid, morons, you know, backward people, you know, common people, but you're an elite person because you don't believe in that stuff. Okay, Mr. Atheist, why is it that Satan himself believes in God? Satan is not an atheist. Satan is very concerned about God, and so are his demons. They know, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Yeah. What have you to do with us? He's here. He's here to destroy the power of sin and death. That's what he's here to do. What is this demon trying to do? He's trying to stop Jesus from teaching the Word of God, which is what we need. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. You need the eternal Word of God. Satan wants to make sure you're confused and you're baffled and you're perplexed and you can't see the God. No, don't look at God. Don't come to church. Don't go to the synagogue. Don't believe in God. No, 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 no. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Satan wants you to be miserable. This poor man, he's possessed by a demon and he's miserable. Does Satan care that this guy is humiliating himself in front of the whole town? He's from, he's from Capernaum, you know, he's probably like one of your neighbors or something. Satan doesn't care. He uses people. He abuses people. Go ahead, stick the needle in your arm. The end is going to be death and destruction, not just of you, but of your family and everybody you know. That's what Satan wants to do. He doesn't care. He doesn't care about destroying this poor guy coming in here. He's trying to break up the beautiful moment of the presence of God. Well, what does Jesus do? He rebukes him. Now, rebuke is too weak of a word. It has Jesus saying, be silent. In the King James, it's hold thou thy peace. <laughs> uh, wrong. The word is muzzle. Like you have a pit bull, a mad dog, and you put a muzzle on the dog to keep the dog from howling and yapping and biting and attacking. That's the word, be muzzled. Stop it. In other words, what do you do? 
You don't give them a floor. You don't give them hours and hours and hours and hours to pontificate about all their issues and problems. You tell them, thank you, shut up. That's what this means. It means shut up. Be quiet. Don't listen to them. Look at their lives. What's the ultimate thing? By their fruits ye shall know them. I said this over and over again. You're a genius. You have a perfect system. You have a perfect philosophy, a perfect ideology. Look at your life. If your life is a train wreck, what are you doing going around telling the rest of us how to live? We're Christians. We should take our instructions from one person only, and that's Jesus of Nazareth and the Holy Bible. We get off track when we start saying, we have a better way. Yes, some dope-smoking philosopher in California in the 1970s came up with a perfect philosophy. Let's all do that. Well, that's why our lives are a wreck. Because we listen to other voices instead of listening to the voice. He says, be silent. Now stop. Is Jesus a magician? No. There were, there were magicians in the first century AD, you know. And what do they do? Usually they have an incantation. Like a formula, you say, abracadabra or something. Or they do sympathetic magic. What's that? It's like a rain dance in the Native American tradition where you pour water on the ground and then it'll make the clouds and the gods give you rain. Okay, so if you have to set the example, is that what Jesus does? No, he doesn't do the magic thing. He doesn't make a big drama out of it. Okay, stop the synagogue. Please come forward. Let's have a big, big ceremony here for people's entertainment value. No, he doesn't. Why? Because he's not a magician. He's the word made flesh. And he says one word. Be silent. Muzzle. Be quiet. Come out of him. He commands. Why? Because he's the second member of the Holy Trinity. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God spoke the world into existence. Ex nihilo. There was nothing here. And God said, let there be light. God doesn't have to have some incantation or some magic tricks or some deception or something, Siegfried and Roy thing. He just says it and it's done. It's accomplished. Because God cannot lie. God speaks. The Word made flesh is Jesus. He says, be silent. And they were. And guess what? Immediately, the unclean spirit came, convulsed the man and cried out in a loud voice. Again, Satan, demon, he's a shouter, he's a yeller. He screams and yells and shouts and opens. He's out of control. Convulsed him. The word is, uh, you know, schizophrenic. Schiz means like torn, ripped. We saw this before, up a few verses, where the heavens are ripped open and the voice of God says, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Who is Jesus? He's the Son of God. The God the Father said it himself. The heavens are ripped open. This man is schizo. He's ripped. He's torn. Why? Because Satan, he wants division. He wants you to be torn against yourself. He wants you to be torn against your neighbors. He wants you to be torn against everybody and everything. He wants you raging and foaming at the mouth and jumping up and down and being out of control. Victory for Satan. Jesus wants you whole. He wants you balanced. He wants you and your family to be prosperous and happy and successful. Satan wants you dead. He wants you poor. He wants you sick. He wants you to be alone. Every bad thing you can think about is what Satan wants for you. God is the opposite. He loves you. He loves you so much. His son, the word became flesh, came down here to save us and to redeem our world. To bring wholeness and health to people like this poor man. This poor man that's possessed by demons. Now let me talk about this for one second and then we'll close this up. Who can count to four? I can count to four. When you read, <laughs> I didn't count to four. Okay, when you read the Gospel of Mark, there are 17 miracles. 17 miracles. What's the purpose of miracles? To show you that Jesus is greater than. Make that greater than sign. I put it in your notes here. Jesus is greater than what? Satan. 
Today is Victory Over Satan Day. We had another one up a few verses in the temptation of Christ. Jesus is victor victorious over temptation. So he's victory over Satan. Number two, victory over disease. What's disease? Disease is out of balance. You're out of balance. Okay. And victory over nature. He walks on the water, feeds the 5,000. And the fourth one is victory over death itself. He raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. He raises Lazarus from the dead. And ultimately, he walks out of the tomb, defeating sin and death. Jesus is greater than Satan, nature, disease, and death. 17 miracles in the Gospel of Mark. Again, Mark is writing for Roman readers. We like, Romans like action, right? Not just a bunch of philosophical gobbledygook. Words are fine, but Romans like action. So this is the action gospel, okay? So let's wrap this up. Again, the people are amazed. They're dumbfounded. They're, they're like, what is this? <coughs> he does it with his words. They're amazed. They're stunned. They're astonished. And with his deeds, they're amazed, stunned, and astonished. Balance. See how this balance works like this? Balanced. And they said, what is this? What is this? Now, do you read the Old Testament? Well, yeah, we should read a lot more of it. Remember, Moses is in the wilderness leading the children of Israel for 40 years. And they just escaped from Egypt. They're slaves. They're not persons. Now they're becoming a nation. What does God do? He gives them a gift. Every morning when they wake up, they walk outside, and there's this stuff, like angel food cake, laying on the ground. And they look at it, and they eat it. It's sweet. And they, it's a, they, they say, manna. What does the word manna mean? It means, ready? What is this? What is it? That's what manna means. So if you read the Old Testament, and you see these people going, what is it? What is this? What is it? What is it? They're saying, manna, manna, manna. Yeah. I am the bread of life. Think about that. It's the one thing you need. You need the bread of life. You need the manna. What is this? It's a new teaching. What do you mean a new teaching? I don't see any teaching here. I'll tell you what the teaching is. He says it, and then he does it. And it's perfectly balanced. There's no hypocrisy in this Jesus. Epiphany. What does it look like if God became flesh and dwelt among us? It looks like this. Words and deeds perfectly balanced. What do we do about it? We have demons among us. Don't let, don't listen to them. Focus on the word of God. During this time of crisis, you come to church, you read the Holy Bible, you read the one essential thing, and you pray for deliverance. They can't believe it. Even unclean spirits obey him. This demon came to try to break up the service, the beautiful service at, sit, at the synagogue in Capernaum on the Sabbath day. And Jesus is victorious in the gladiator contest in the Colosseum. What happened? At once, at that moment, his fame spread throughout all of the region of Galilee. This is called an honor-shame society in the ancient Near East. What do Romans like? They like honorable people, people like Julius Caesar. He fights the Gauls for 12 years and he gets a triumph through the streets of Rome. Honor is something that has to be acquired through your actions. What do we like? We like, well, if you go to college, you get a degree and you start out as being president of the multinational corporation the next day. We don't believe in starting in the mailroom and learning the job and working your way up over 20 years and then maybe getting a leadership position. Acquired honor. Jesus is acquiring honor. His friends and neighbors are bearing witness to who he is and what he does. Word and sacrament. It's words and deeds balanced in perfect harmony. That is who Jesus is. On this Epiphany Day, Focused on Christ. 
in your battles. Focus on Jesus, the eternal word. Amen. Will the congregation please turn to our hymn of the day, Precious Lord Take My Hand, 102 in the blue hymn book, 102. for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is a new testament in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the remission of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil, for that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Will the congregation please come forward for Holy Communion? Please observe social distancing rules. It's, it's communion with no contact. 